Good morning, church. Welcome to Crawford Avenue Baptist Church. It's good to see everyone here this morning. My name is Stephen Story. I serve as one of the pastors here, and I'm going to share just a few announcements as we begin our time together today. Uh, well, today marks the beginning of our fall semester uh, as a church family. Of course, this morning we all enjoyed a wonderful breakfast together as we get back into the routine of Sunday morning Bible study cohorts. And uh, many of our community groups that took a break over the summer are going to resume meeting this week. And, of course, Wednesday night is the beginning of our uh, fall semester of Wednesday night classes. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting things happening uh, in the life of the church. In your bulletin, you have uh, a simple schedule that gives an overview of the things coming up for the fall. Uh, that's provided for you. Uh, maybe stick that in the back of your uh, Bible or uh, uh, post it on your fridge at home so you can just be aware of the things that are coming up in the life of the church. With uh, Wednesday night classes resuming this week, we're also resuming Wednesday night dinners. And as we've uh, been mentioning, we are uh, making some adjustments with how we do Wednesday night dinners this fall. Unlike in the past, uh, you must register in advance if you'll be uh, participating in Wednesday night dinner on any given week. So each Friday at noon is the deadline to sign up for the dinner the following Wednesday. That means that the deadline for this Wednesday night dinner has already passed. Uh, so uh, a number of folks are planning to join us for dinner Wednesday night. If you did not sign up for dinner this Wednesday night, we love you, and we will not be preparing dinner for you this week. Uh, so you're, of course, welcome to join next week. Uh, this Friday at noon is uh, the deadline to let us know that you'll be joining us next week. Uh, you can uh, do that on the church website, crawfordavenue.org slash register. Uh, you can use the church center app uh, to let us know you'll be attending dinner. Or you can just call uh, the church office or email us, and we'll be glad to help you with that. Uh, one uh, announcement that's not in your bulletin, next Sunday, uh, as a church, we plan to commission two of our members, Ellie Nelson and Ellie Paulhill, as uh, they prepare to embark on a two-year missionary assignment. 
uh, with a church in, uh, in Southeast Asia. So we've been talking about uh, this for a number of weeks and praying for them. A number of folks have given generously uh, to fund this mission that they'll be uh, embarking on. So next Sunday, uh, we'll be praying uh, for the Ellies, and then after the service, we'll have a simple reception uh, in their honor. And that'll be a chance for us as a church to say goodbye to them and send them off uh, on this two-year assignment. You may be a guest with us today, and if so, I just want to say a special welcome to you. Uh, we're glad that you're here visiting with us, and uh, I'd invite you to do two things this morning. Uh, on the back of the bulletin, you'll see a QR code, and uh, we'd invite you to scan that QR code. It'll take you to a, a page where you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, we'd love to know if there's uh, any ways that we can be praying for you this week. If you have any questions about what it means to be a Christian, you can let us know, and we'll get in touch with you this week. Um, if you prefer, you can also communicate with us using a paper connection card, and you'll find those in the offering boxes at the doors around the room. Uh, second thing, if you're a guest with us, make sure that you stop by our welcome table. It's in the, the foyer uh, in the back of the room, and at the end of the service, stop by that welcome table. We have a gift for you, is our way of saying welcome to the church, and uh, have someone there who will look forward to meeting you and be happy to answer any questions that you might have. We will worship the Lord through giving today. You know, when we give our tithes and offerings, we give with joy because in giving, we are partnering together to advance the gospel. There's a number of ways that you can give uh, tithes and offerings. You can uh, text to give. Uh, you also can give on our website, uh, or you can make use of the offering boxes at the doors uh, to give your physical tithes and offerings. Well, we have gathered together today to worship God, whose love for us, his people, will never fail. In 1 John chapter 4, we read, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. We'll begin with a moment of silent prayer so that we can focus our thoughts and our attention on God who has loved us in this way. So let's take a moment now and pray silently together. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the power of the Holy Spirit as those who have been redeemed by your Son, the Lord Jesus. He who came from heaven and took on flesh to rescue mortal man has died for the sins of every man who professes his name. Since we, therefore, have such a Savior in you, the one who laid his life down, and bore the wrath of God on our behalf. We ask that you would give us grace and fortitude to sing your praise in the face of whatever trials may be before us now. May our refrain ever be, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. O oh Lord, you have promised that nothing could ever separate us from your love. And you have proven as much by your cross and by your resurrection. May we therefore take up our own cross. For even as we do so, we know that such a yoke is easy and light compared to a life without your loving kindness. Strengthen our resolve, even this hour. Grant us joy as we sing and encourage one another in the truths of Scripture. 
Have your way in us, O Lord, and be glorified by loud praise. It's in the worthy name of Christ we pray all these things. Amen. Many trials beset the Christian, but the hope we have in Christ propels us to that final day when we will be with him again. Let's stand and begin with a song as we worship together. This life is filled with trials and temptations to abandon the Lord or to forsake his paths. He, however, is the only sure way forward, even if it means that the road which leads to righteousness is seemingly perilous. David is recorded as saying the following in 2 Samuel, This God, his way is perfect. 
The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Let's read this part together. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. Christ is our sure foundation and our refuge in times of trouble and distress. As we go to him now in a moment of silent prayer, confess to the Lord anything that might be troubling you about your current situation in life, whether it's financial distress, physical ailment, relational turmoil, or upheaval in any area of life. We can turn to the Lord and trust in him and his ways. So let's confess sin in silent prayer and ask the Lord for grace moving forward. Lord, we confess that we are so often tempted to consider our own thoughts and our own ways as higher than your ways. But the truth is just the opposite. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We ask that you would help us to trust in you with all our heart. Help us, Lord, to lean not on our own understanding, but instead let us acknowledge you in all our ways. Your word tells us that if we do that, you will make all of our paths straight. May we rely on you to straighten our paths and not result to sin or distress when we can't figure out a way forward on our own. You are a strong refuge and you are the one who has made our way blameless. O Lord, grant us grace to forsake sin and doubt, trusting in you with each step, each hour, each breath, each night of rest. O Lord, you are worthy of our trust. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Dear refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee when waves of trouble roll, my fainting hope relies to thee. Prevail, I fear to go. 
just gone, where shall I flee? Thou art my only trust, and still my soul would Thou not bid me see thy face, and shall I seek in vain? And can the eve of sovereign grace be death when I complain? No sin. church. Please be seated. As Don comes forward for our scripture reading, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 8 through 22. If you're using one of the black Bibles under the chair in front of you, you'll find that passage begins on page 1015. In this passage, the apostle Peter asks the question, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Such a question is good enough on its own, but when you consider its source, it's the disciple, Peter, who denied Jesus three times in order to avoid suffering. When we consider this, it takes on a deeper meaningfulness. Peter has learned both the heartache of unfaithfulness and the joy of suffering for the name of Christ. Therefore, he also says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, You will be blessed. Hear now God's word. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 22. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, Bless, for to this you have that you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring to us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. Amen. This is God's word. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Brown. I serve as one of the elders here at Crawford. Uh, as we come to corporate prayer this morning, we're going to pray for Megan and Ben Jolly, who were married yesterday, uh, for Lane Bush, who was born to Jonathan and Taylor Bush. Uh, we're going to pray for the restart of Wednesday nights and cohorts, and for the nation of Malawi in Africa. So, thank you. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning that you would fill our hearts with a spirit of worship, that we would sing praises to your name. Help us to tell the world of your greatness, to help us to declare your glory among the nations and to speak of your works among all people. Greatly are you to be praised, and there is none like you. You made the heavens, and all of your splendor and majesty are before you. Let the splendor of your holiness drive us to worship you. Let all the people of the world tremble before your glory. You will judge all people with equity, righteousness, and faithfulness. We pray that the whole world would rejoice in you. For those who are here today who know you, let us praise you for your grace and mercy, giving thanks with our whole heart for our salvation. Lead us to put away sin in our lives and to desire what you desire and to hate what you hate. Help us to be known as a people who love you and help us to put aside idols and sinful desires. For Ben and Megan Jolly, we praise you for bringing them together and we rejoice with them in their marriage. Let them be strong together and have their shared faith in you be the bedrock of their relationship. We pray as in Ephesians, that they would be kind and compassionate to each other, forgiving each other as Christ has forgiven them. Let their marriage point both of them and others to you. We further rejoice with Jonathan and Taylor Bush in the birth of their daughter, Lane. All children are a gift from you, and we pray that Lane would be blessed to come to know you quickly. We ask that both Jonathan and Taylor would surround Lane with evidence of their faith that points her to you, and that they would see your provision and love for them as they seek to raise Lane in the faith. As the church begins with our cohort and Wednesday night ministries, we ask that you would bless these gatherings and that your name would be glorified in all that was taught and discussed. Scripture commands us to make disciples, and we praise you for this opportunity to study your word together and to learn to be more Christ-like. We thank you for all who will come, and we ask that this would be a season that encourages us to study, pray, and grow in our faith. We also thank you for Jesse Holmes, for his leadership in this area of our ministry, 
for his heart for discipleship and for his obvious and clear love for you and this congregation. For the nation of Malawi, we pray for the wisdom and relief. Well, we pray for wisdom and relief as they struggle with AIDS and poverty. Give the government and the leaders in this nation the wisdom to navigate these issues and to proactively lead their nation using biblical principles. We pray that we praise you that there is peace in this nation and that Christian ministries are allowed to be active. Give these ministries and the Christians in this nation the wisdom to combat the rising influence of Islam and that they would have both a loving and impactful ministry among Muslims. In all things, we know that you are in control. We ask for your mercy and continued grace on us. Guide us to love you with all our heart, mind, and strength. In Christ and we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as we have just read in 1 Peter 3, Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Let's stand to sing of the work that he did on the cross. It's made her by sin. 
pick up our cross and follow after him. Jesus, I
be seated. Amen. I invite you to take your copy of scripture and turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And uh, this morning we will be looking at verses 35 to 39. Romans chapter 8 and uh, looking at verses 35 to 39. As you're turning there, I want to remind you that next Sunday we will be uh, having a prayer service here at the church at 6 p.m. And all are invited to the prayer service. And really want to encourage you to come and be a part of that time together as a church. It's a wonderful time for us to worship the Lord and express our dependence upon Him in prayer. So next Sunday at 6 p.m. Uh, we'll meet for a prayer service. And then following the prayer service, we'll ask our members to stay behind for a short members meeting. This morning we're in Romans 8, and uh, I'll begin reading for us in verse 28 and read through to the end of the chapter. So Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your great love for us in Christ. And we are thankful for how your word so faithfully and beautifully proclaims that love to us. We pray now, Lord, that as we turn to the Scriptures, that you would cause the reality of your love to be real to our own hearts, and that we would be encouraged and strengthened, sustained and comforted. Lord, we pray that our hope and faith in you would grow and increase. 
So, Father, give us insight into your word now, and uh, we pray that you would bless this time by the power of your Holy Spirit. And it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, I have mentioned that some consider Romans chapter 8 to be the greatest chapter and the greatest letter and the greatest book ever written. So, Romans 8 is the greatest chapter, the greatest letter being Paul's letter to the Romans, and the greatest book being the Bible. And this morning, we will conclude our study in this extraordinary chapter. Some have likened the end of Romans chapter 8 to a staircase. And essentially what's happening here is over the last several weeks as we've been working through Romans chapter 8, as we've been taking one step further up that staircase ascending higher and higher and higher as it builds and builds and now reaches the pinnacle, the apex, as Paul escorts us into the glories of God's everlasting love for his people. As Paul has led us on this journey in the latter part of Romans chapter 8, there are five questions that have served as kind of trail markers along the way. And you see them there in the text. Verse 31, the first question, if God is for us, who can be against us? A second question in verse 32, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Question 3 in verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? The fourth question is found in verse 34, who is to condemn And now this final question in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? John Stott, in commenting on these questions, writes, quote, Paul hurls these questions into space, as it were, in a spirit of bold defiance. He challenges anybody and everybody in heaven, earth, or hell to answer them and to deny the truth which they contain, end of quote. Well, this morning we'll give our attention to Paul's final question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And so I want us to consider that question, and then after we consider that question, we will see three assurances of Christ's love. And each one of these is consequential. Because if we are to experience the certainty, the hope of Christ's love for us, then we also must possess this bold defiance to resist all the forces of heaven and earth that would cause us to doubt God's great love for us in Christ. So this morning our outline is the question, we'll consider the question in verse 35, and then we'll consider three assurances of Christ's love in verses 36 to 39. And I'll go ahead and give you those assurances. I know a number of you are taking notes. So we'll see the assurance of Christ's love found in the Scriptures, the assurance of Christ's love found in God's sovereignty, and the assurance of Christ's love found in Paul's testimony. So the question, and then three assurances, the assurance of Scripture, of God's sovereignty, and of Paul's testimony. All right, so look at the question in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, we've seen this in Romans 8 before, that sometimes Paul will pose a question, and part of the answer to that question is found in the question itself. And we see that again here in verse 35. Notice, if you look there again carefully in the question, we read these words, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, who is the us that Paul is referring to here in verse 35. Well, if we look at the larger context of Romans 8, and especially the latter part of the chapter, we see that the us here refers to those in verses 28 to 30 whom God foreknew and predestined and called and justified and glorified. The us also refers to those in verse 31 for whom God is for. The us here also refers to those in verse 32 for whom God gave up his own son. The us also refers 
to those who we saw last week in verses 33 and 34 who are God's elect and for whom God, or actually the Lord Jesus himself, is presently interceding. So when we consider of whom Paul speaks here in our text, he is speaking of God's elect, he's speaking of God's chosen ones, of course the answer is no one, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. But we also see further from the question, in this question, that there's there's another part of the answer. So we've seen of whom Paul speaks, But notice also in the question of whose love Paul speaks. It is the love of Christ. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So notice here in our text, Paul is not speaking here of our love for Christ, but rather he's speaking of Christ's love for us. This is further confirmed when Paul goes on to state, In verse 37, that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And in verse 39, when he speaks of the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's the reason, here's the foundation for our great confidence, our great peace in God's love for us. Our assurance does not rest in our love for Christ, but rather in Christ's perfect love for us. Martin Lloyd-Jones states it this way, quote, What matters is God's love to us, not our love to God. Our love is weak and frail and and, uh, fallible. It wanes and waxes, comes and goes. Thank God my salvation does not depend on me, but on God's love to me, not upon my frail grip of Him, but upon His strong grasp of me, end of quote. And so it is with great confidence that we can say, nothing shall separate us, no one shall separate us from the love of Christ, for Christ's love for us will never fail. Now, of course, this point that Paul is making in verse 35 is true in every and all circumstances. Nothing, no one can separate us from the love of Christ. But I want you to see here in the text that Paul intends to test this claim in, very, in a very specific set of circumstances. Look there in the text again in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And here it is. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Now whenever we see a list like this in the Scriptures, we should pause and give some thought to whether or not we can discern a pattern or a common theme in the list. And the prevailing theme in this list is persecution. In fact, we recognize as we read through this list that the list is autobiographical for the Apostle Paul. In other words, in laying out this list, Paul is telling his story. He's telling his story as a Christian, as a faithful missionary, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are all hardships that Paul has experienced as he has followed Christ in discipleship and faithfully proclaimed his gospel and made disciples of all nations. The first three here that are mentioned in the list are similar and could be categorized more generally under the head of persecution. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution The following two could be labeled as persecution experienced through physical hardship, famine, or nakedness. And then the last two could be identified as persecution at the hand of others, danger, and the sword. And Paul knew all of these hardships as a consequence of his missionary work. Paul especially gives us insight into the sufferings that he endured in his missionary endeavors when he writes his letters to the church in Corinth. There's many places that we could turn in those letters, but just one example is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11.